thank you all for coming and listening. I, I love this conference is, is all about building a brand. I think that's a great, great theme. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, during this, during this talk, really try and teach you two things, okay? One is really boots on the ground, how to protect the brand that you're building, how to stop other people from taking your profits away from you. And also, I want to keep everyone in the room that I can. So at the very, very end, you're all going to learn how each one of you can help fight um, to find a cure for pediatric cancers. Okay, and I'm not kidding about that, but I'm going to save that for the very, very end. Cost you nothing. Um, so uh, let me get on with it. Okay, so my name is C.J. Rosenbaum, and I'm a lawyer in New York, and we have 32 people working around the world doing nothing but helping sellers online. The vast majority are on Amazon, and our practice focuses on avoiding and getting back from suspensions, but more important to branding, how to develop your brand and how to protect it from other people stealing your profits. So I'm going to be talking about that today, how to protect your brand, trademark, copyright, patent, trade dress, and I'm going to go really fast, and I talk fast because I'm from New York anyway. Um, Amazon, eBay, uh, AliExpress, all the different platforms where you really suffer the most hijackers who steal your sales. So on Amazon, Amazon makes it ridiculously easy for a brand to knock a seller off, okay? So if you're an Amazon seller, you kind of live in fear of any brand making a complaint because when that complaint comes in, you don't know as a seller whether you're just going to lose that product for a little while or if your entire account's going to get suspended. And if your entire account gets suspended, your inventory is usually locked up with Amazon. They're not releasing the money that you've already earned to you. Um, let's say you earned $100,000 on Amazon and only 5% was of the brand that claims that you violated their rights. They hold 100% of the money, okay? Also, in the States at least, Amazon has over 60 cents out of every single dollar spent online. 60 cents out of every dollar. So they're a giant elephant in the room. It, it's as if every single storefront in the entire country is one landlord, and they could just shut you down without warning. Okay? So the leverage that you have as a brand is really strong. Um, the risk that you face as a buyer, as a seller, really kind of stinks because there really is a terrible, terrible system. Uh, but it's really easy to protect your brand on Amazon as long as you avoid these words. And some of this is really kind of silly, okay? Or I think as the Brits say, it's kind of dodgy, where if you use the word distribution, Amazon will ignore even a substantive complaint. Or if you use the word authorized or unauthorized, Amazon will ignore a, a real complaint, a real violation. They'll just ignore it. Okay, this is it, okay? This is the entire form, okay? It's these six boxes on Amazon that you as a brand owner or a future brand owner need to fill in to make a complaint against any seller anywhere on Amazon, anywhere in the globe. That's it. So if you develop a brand, it really is easy to really to go nuclear, but I don't recommend you go nuclear right away. We're going to talk about how we protect brands and how I suggest that you protect brands since in this whole crazy online world, uh, we all kind of live and die by reviews. And on Amazon, it's called an ODR, an order defect rate, and returns. Okay, So while it is super, super easy to make a nuclear complaint against sellers if you're a brand, I'm recommending you don't go there right away. It's not good business, and I personally think it's just it's wrong. Um, eBay has a little bit more of a robust system where, unlike on Amazon, if this gentleman in the first row wanted to make a complaint on Amazon, he doesn't have to show he owns anything. As ridiculous as that sounds, anybody can make a complaint against anybody else on Amazon, and they're reviewed by people that, as far as I can tell, have absolutely no legal training at all. On eBay, you have to at least claim to own some intellectual property right, be it a copyright, a trademark, a patent, either design, a utility. You actually have to at least claim that you own something. Um, this is the Vero complaint. It's a little bit more robust. You have to put filing numbers and show that you own something, or at least make that claim in order for eBay to accept that complaint. Okay? 
And these are all formed, at least in the US, on what's called the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. And what it did, it gave platforms a safe harbor, called a safe harbor provision, where they can harm you all they want, but as long as they take down products when they receive a complaint, they avoid any potential liability. Okay, AliExpress is a Chinese company, and we're going to talk about some Chinese intellectual property laws in a little while. They have sort of followed Chinese IP law. Now, in the US, in the UK, Australia, and most of the world, if you're the first person to use a brand or use a logo or to draft copyright material, you know, anything you write or music or a movie or pictures, um, you own rights to it under what we call common law. It's existed for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, in China, you don't own anything at all unless you register that right. And the presumption is against ownership unless you've properly registered in China. So AliExpress actually requires you okay, to have a registered company and have a fully registered right, even though it often puts them at odds with US and UK law. OK, so how do you develop your rights and, and how do you protect your rights as you're growing your brand? Um, and also, I don't think I put it in the slide. You know, developing your own private label brand, your own branded material, you're actually building an asset where if you're making your income, if you're developing your business, you're selling on other platforms, you really don't own much. But if you develop your brand, you develop an asset that you can actually sell in the future. You can take it offline. You can take it to your own website. And you, there are businesses, uh, we work with one called Empire Flippers, that buy and sell online businesses, and they specifically focus on online brands. So trademark, copyright, patent, and trade dress are the, are the different rights you need to be concerned about. And protecting is filing and who you need to protect yourselves from. And we're going to talk a little bit about warranties, which could be a great sword to use against unauthorized sellers. Um, all right, basic, basic trademark law, whether it's here or in the States or any place except China. It, it's the logo, the drawing, the word that identifies the product almost on a visceral level, OK? Um, the Apple products, OK? You know they're going to be a little bit overpriced, but they're never going to crash. Uh, Coca-Cola, it's a, that distinct glass bottle that's known around the globe. McDonald's french fries, you know, I mean, it tastes the same. If you get a Big Mac anywhere from here to China to South Korea, anywhere in the world, somehow it tastes miraculously the exact same, okay? So this is basic trademark law. Now, the basics that sellers need to know is you cannot take somebody else's mark and stick it on your product or your hat or your shirt. If you're not doing that, if you're buying and selling in the US, it's totally fine. You don't need anybody's authorization. Uh, here in the UK, you do need a brand's authorization. That is part of, of the intellectual property rights here in the UK. Basic copyright law for sellers, OK? This is basically what you need to know. You can't use somebody else's picture, OK? As soon as they take that photograph, they own copyright into it, whether they actually file or not. Okay, you don't have to file for copyright protection. And, and verbiage, written words. As soon as you write a description, you own those words. Now, if you want to sell a similar product, you need to change those words a bit. There may be only a certain number of ways of saying things, and certain things are not protected. Um, like in the supplement industry, GMO-free, that's not protectable. Vegetarian capsules, it's not protectable. But describing how the product works or describing uh, or the verbiage in your warranty, that is protected. If you write it, even if you don't file, you own those rights. So copyright law is images and, and verbiage. OK, patents or patents are basically licenses issued by the government. OK, if you have uh, rights here, you can file for rights in the United States, whether it's trademark or, trademark or patent through the World Intellectual Property Organization. It's about 300 bucks per filing. That's it. That's for, for trademarks. Um, patents come in two different flavors. You have design patents, and you have utility. Utility would be this clicker that you click the button and the slide changes. How something works, the invention of it all. That's utility. If you can get it, it is super powerful because you get a certain period of time and nobody else can, can, can sell that, that device without paying you or making a contract with you. Um, 
Design is more like how it looks. This hourglass shape, hourglass shape of this clicker, okay? That's the design of it. That's the design patent of it. So if you took it and you made it rectangle or square, right, or oval, you would no longer be violating that design patent, okay? That's the basics for sellers. Now, trade dress is like, you know, look, lawyers dwell on the amorphous, okay? We live and die on argument where any lawyer can argue both sides of anything. And that's where trade dress becomes kind of cool, or at least I kind of geek out on it, okay? Anyone ever see this beauty blender sponge? All right, not a whole lot of makeup users here. This, this sponge is used to sort of blend makeup. And the only difference between this sponge and any other sponge that's sold is that it, this egg-shaped fuchsia color, right, this clear plastic with the dots and the font, it's the whole package. The whole package of it is called trade dress, and it never expires, okay? It's good forever, with or without filing. You, you own that, and it's unique. And Beauty Blender has been remarkably successful at keeping other sellers off and indefinitely by using the egg shape, the fuchsia color, and the clear packaging. The same thing with this dehumidifier in the shape of a teardrop, okay? Because it's a dehumidifier, there is no utility patent on how it puts you know, moisture into the air. But the fact that it's shaped into a teardrop has also been very, very successful. And Brain Flakes, Brain Flakes is kind of an interesting brand because it's these plastic discs that look like snowflakes at the interlock and kids make all this artwork out of it. And they weren't really having a lot of great traction protecting their trade dress until they went to court in the Northern District of Illinois, which is in the, in the city of Chicago in the US. And that court said, you've got trade dress because of the unique shape, color, and texture of these little discs, okay? And they've been also super successful with no expiration, okay? You own it forever. So this is trade dress. It's the whole look, feel, shape, color, and texture of a product. Now, basic, I talked about this a little bit. The differences you need to know since, um, you know, what, like 90% of all the factories are in, are in China, okay? And if you're having a, a successful product that you're manufacturing in China, you need to protect yourself where your products are manufactured. And in China, the big difference is that you must, must, must file. And the tertiary differences are the cultural differences, all right? Now, uh, I grew up with a big sister, okay? My sister, Jamie, um, I was always a spaz. I couldn't play any sports, and she was a jock, right? And she was always bigger and stronger than me until I hit, like, 22. It's really, like, 16, but whatever. So... Um, what she would do is if I tried to mimic her, she'd call me a copycat, right? And this got under my skin, made me feel bad about myself that I was copying her. And she'd beat the crap out of me for copying her. In China, that, that doesn't exist. When you copy someone, it's a form of flattery. Like you can have Kentucky Fried Chicken and Atlanta Fried Chicken. You could have Starbucks and Tea Bucks. And there's no cultural taboo against copying somebody. And so when you have to explain that, to, to a business person in China, they can't copy uh, Black & Decker's orange and black on a power tool. They don't really get it. There's a cultural difference there that they don't get. So there's significant legal differences, and there's also significant cultural differences. Now, if you want to protect yourself against your own factory, there are certain things you need to do, okay? You must register your trademark in China. You must. You can get some protection by filing through WIPO in China, but the categories don't exactly match up. China has, instead of the 25 international categories, and I have a few of them, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of subcategories of products. So you need to make sure you, and we, we can send you to a Chinese lawyer, um, you need to file in your specific category if you want protection from your own factory. And my understanding is, uh, the Chinese business people want absolutely zero to do with the government, okay? And if the government should interact with them, if they should want a meeting, uh, they call it getting invited for tea, and nobody wants to get invited for tea. So these are some of the things you need to do to protect yourself in China. Here's a sample of, of some of the subcategories in, in like sportswear, okay? Bras are a different subcategory from boxer shorts, 
which is a different category from a belly band. I'm not really sure what that is, okay? But I know it's different, and if you want to protect yourself, you need to file for that. Uh, the same thing with bathrobes and beach clothes, okay? There's so many different categories that if you have a successful product, I wouldn't recommend you do it right off the bat, but if you have a product that's doing well, you want to make sure you file in a way that you can protect yourself or give you some leverage against your own factory in China. Okay, also in China, products tend to develop different names. Sometimes the names in China are just phonetics um, in, in the Chinese vernacular. Other times it's just, you know, just somehow comes up, like, you know, Nike is basically Nike, okay? Um, but if you look at uh, Citibank, Star Spangled Banner Bank, or Marriott, 10,000 wealthy elites, okay? Um, one of the prior speakers used the Ritz-Carlton as an example and the stuffed giraffe, right? Um, I thought that was really cool. That's Ritz-Carlton. I think that's more like 10,000 wealthy elites, but in China, it, it, that's what Marriott calls himself. Colgate revealing superior cleanliness. So when you're protecting your rights against China, you not only have to protect yourself for your logo and your name, you have to sort of identify what the Chinese culture has assigned to your product and protect against that as well, all right? And I got to tell you something. There are some beautiful, beautiful Range Rovers driving all over China, and they're made by a Chinese company because Range Rover neglected to file in China. I've got some other kind of cool examples based upon, I guess, not so much your politics. So President Trump had a big fight for about 10 or 15 years before he ran for the United States presidency, where he didn't own his own name on buildings and clothing and all sorts of stuff, right? But miraculously, once he became president, he got everything back, and, except for this toilet seat, all right? Now, I am not a huge Trump fan, okay? And I love this toilet seat, all right? Uh, but some other people that are kind of heroes of the United States, Air Jordan, um, he eventually, I think, purchased Nike. They purchased the rights back because they couldn't win. And the top says iPhone on it. Apple fought all the way through all the different levels of the court system in China to get their, their name back because they also failed to register in all the different categories. And they lost in leather goods. So to this day, Apple does not own the right to sell iPhone leather goods. It's owned by another company. So as your product, if it starts doing well, okay, you need to fear your own factory. You need to have leverage to be able to negotiate a resolution to, to get that factory to stop selling your products to somebody else. All right, so I, I kind of skip ahead. If you are a private label seller to develop your brand, you need to protect in, in really two categories of places, where your products are being sold, okay, and where they're being manufactured. And it's not just China. It's also Thailand. It is, it is also Vietnam's up and coming. If it's textiles, it's India, where they have all the dyes and just the great, great fabrics. But you need to protect your intellectual property rights for your brand wherever you're selling and wherever you're manufacturing. OK, patent protection or patents. You can file through in, in the Chinese government, the SIPO filing. Uh, we have a book that's coming out. It's, it's uh, Seller's Guide to Chinese Intellectual Property Law, where they're, they're very formulaic in China, okay? Unlike the U.S., where it's kind of opinion and does this mark, you know, going to confuse consumers or if it's not, China's much more step by step by step. And if you can work your way into the great firewall going sort of the wrong way, um, you can actually file for these rights yourself through a really click system. Okay, same thing with, with trademark. If any of you email me or reach out to me, I will send you the steps to file for your own trademark in China, okay? The biggest problem with it is just not crashing. Um, everyone in China uses VPNs to get, on, get out of the great firewall and put them someplace else. I still haven't identified a great system for breaking in, okay? Uh, but once you go in, it might take you know, 10 or 20 tries, you can file your mark yourself in China and get that protection and protect yourself again against your own factory. Okay, hijackers, counterfeit, and gray market goods, okay? 
Hijackers refers to people who are jumping on your listing and selling your products on the page you created, okay? Uh, Amazon specifically, there's one page for every single product and all the different sellers, whether it's one or a hundred, sell on that same page, okay? And when someone else jumps on what you feel is your page, we call them a hijacker. Counterfeit products are fake goods, they're knockoffs. Gray market, okay? Gray market are the real deal, the real products, they're not counterfeit, okay? They just somehow got through your, your intended chain of distribution. And there are ways of stopping sellers from doing that. And I really, I was going to say I feel bad about it, but I really don't feel bad about it. Just who I am. I am a lawyer. Um, we have used our, our unique knowledge of helping sellers against baseless complaints to develop ways of protecting your brand and building in significant complaints. Okay? So hijackers, counterfeit, and gray market. Okay. The first thing you want to do, if you're selling, whether it's on Amazon or eBay or Etsy or Newegg or Jet or Walmart or eCrater or anybody else, okay, is you need to monitor your listings, okay? You got to watch it. If you have just a handful, it's really easy. You're going to be doing it yourself anyway. And you're going to know in, in five seconds, okay, uh, whether someone else is on your listing. Once you have more than a couple of dozen or hundreds, you got to automate it. We use software that's owned by a client of ours. Uh, we get a report every single day for every listing that we are monitoring as to who's selling. And then we identify who's authorized and who's unauthorized. But you need to monitor your listings. This is the company we use, Map Services Corp. Um, they're good, and I, I just trust them. I like to do business with people that I know and that I trust. Uh, but there are a whole host of, of other software out there that monitors listings. Uh, then you're going to get a report. You're going to identify who is violating your intellectual property rights or who is not delivering to the consumer what you deliver to the consumer. And here's, here's where the humane aspect is. Here's where I think the good business practices come in. You want to give the hijackers, even the counterfeiters, the opportunity to amicably stop selling. Okay? You want to send them what's called a cease and desist letter, a cease and desist email. Basically says, see a seller, you're violating our IP rights. Here's how. Okay, please stop selling. We don't want to have to make a complaint against you. Why do we do this? One, it is super efficient. Okay, our C and Ds get rid of 60 to 70 percent of the unauthorized sellers within that first letter, that first email that goes out the door. Why? Because Amazon sellers don't want to risk getting suspended. It also sparks people calling you to say, listen, I just put my last $10,000 into this product. Can I please sell out my inventory so my wife doesn't kill me for investing in this online business? Okay? And we always say yes and work at a, a deal. Let them sell out. They agree not to jump on your listing anymore. Okay? One, I think it's the right thing to do. And number two, if you don't needlessly put people out of business, they're going to be less likely to make complaints about you. They'll be less likely to have their staff, mothers, brothers, sisters, siblings, cousins, and, and gardeners purchase your product, smash them up, and send them back in and raise your defect rate, okay, or leave you bad reviews. So one, I think morally it's the right thing to do. Number two, it's just good business because it's efficient and effective and you avoid risk. Now, I also believe um, providing a deadline, and uh, uh, there was a U.S. president, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, who said, like, walk softly and carry a big stick, okay? I believe that's good business. So provide a deadline. Let them know what your big stick is. Let them know that if they don't stop selling counterfeit products, you're going to make a complaint against them, okay? That you learn from Amazon seller's lawyer that you can have their whole account shut down by filling out one stupid form with five sections, okay? But give them the opportunity to stop amicably. Now, this is some of the leverage that you have, okay? Suspensions are awful, okay? Um, recouping all profits. If someone is violating your patent, okay, at least in the U.S., you have the right to recoup all of the profits going back all the way to the time that you applied for the patent, not from approval, from application, okay? Now, I know I have not saved every cent of my profit over the last, I don't know, 22 years of practicing law. I spent it. 
right? I got married and divorced. That cost a lot. I've got children. They cost a ton, right? And I have to live. So actually recouping all the profits, that's why like giants, Apple versus Samsung fought forever. And, and Apple won. And they could have compelled Samsung to turn over all of their profits. And they didn't even do it because it, it would just put people out of business. Um, the basic things about suspending the account, freezing their money, okay, uh, freezing their inventory, inspecting their inventory. Um, also, there's a growing area of litigation. And uh, while I am a lawyer, I, I don't push litigation. Litigation is generally really only super good for the lawyers. It's not good for small and medium-sized businesses, okay? Um, but there is a growing trend for seller versus seller and brand versus seller to go to Chicago and get an order from judges freezing their Amazon accounts, their eBay accounts, their Etsy accounts, their bank accounts, their PayPal, their World Docs, World Currency, Payoneer, Payability. It freezes everything, right? We even have seen cases where they froze their private accounts getting through corporations. So you do have this leverage. So if you are losing a ton of sales per month, that might be a viable alternative. But the leverage that you have as a brand is just in incredible. So most of these things be worked out amicably. OK, the US court system, OK? We have what's called an open court system, which means nobody looks at anything when you file it. Nobody, OK? In the state of New York, $210, a two-page form, and you could sue anybody you want. Nobody checks it out the door. There is no gatekeeper. The same thing in the United States federal court, OK? Nobody checks at the door. Um, I don't recommend doing it unless you are losing, I would say, at least five to $10,000 a month, because the litigation is going to cost you between two and 5000 a month. So you want to have at least a double return on your litigation investment, OK? But there's no one, like, it's like, it's not even like someone's asleep at the wheel, because there's no wheel, OK? So, uh, and what you can get are these TROs, these restraining orders, temporary restraining orders, freezing absolutely everything. Hope I'm not scaring anybody from selling online. Okay, now, let's say you are a brand. People have jumped on your listing, either hijackers, counterfeiters, or a gray market, okay? And they refuse to stop selling, okay? Now you have to make a complaint. And it doesn't matter where it's Amazon or, or eBay or any place else. Um, you don't want to discuss, they want to know what map pricing is? Do you have map pricing here in the UK? Minimum advertised price? That's right. Well, it's not that it's illegal. It's that it's not enforced anymore. Um, in the United States, there was a case called Legion, which had to do with leather goods, right? And the United States Supreme Court, the highest court in our land, um, who's being absolutely diluted by our, our Supreme Court picks of this president, but that's just my soapbox. Um, it said that you can't enforce a pricing agreement against people who didn't sign the contract, right? So you don't want to mention map pricing since it's unenforceable. I just talked up earlier about authorized versus unauthorized. You know, Amazon's goal is to provide the most products at the cheapest prices, and Amazon doesn't care as long as they're not counterfeit. Okay, distribution agreements are not enforced, so don't use those words. Okay, um, there's a Cajun saying, Cajun is like uh, Louisiana, um, that it's easier to ride the horse in the direction that it's going. Okay, so if Amazon will not read your reports that have authorization, distribution, or map pricing, don't use that verbiage. Use what works. Okay, counterfeit works. They're not delivering the same warranty that I deliver, OK? We give a factory repair warranty with every product. So as a seller, if you're Logitech and this breaks, OK, Logitech will send this back to the factory and fix it back to specs. No unauthorized seller can do that. They don't have access to the factory. They may be able to get a truckload of your clickers, but they can't send it back to the factory. If you buy this clicker from us, you get a license to log on to a website, and you get software updates. OK? Nobody else can deliver your license. If you buy this clicker from us, you get a whole newsletter on the life benefits of using clickers. OK? Nobody else can deliver your copyright. 
so you can build certain things into your product. Um, also, um, owning a listing, okay? Amazon's policy is that nobody owns anything except for Amazon, okay? Even if you create the listing, you put the picture up, you don't own as far as Amazon is concerned. So you never want to put, they jumped onto my listing. Our company owns this listing. It's as if everything else is ignored, they take it and they throw it in the garbage. So you want to uh, avoid filing baseless complaints and avoid using this verbiage. Okay, so here's my bit of self-promotion as to why you should listen to anything that I have to say. Okay, these are some of the books that we've written. These are the upcoming books. Now, I promised you I'd show you how to protect your brands and how to protect your listings. Okay, and then I told you how I'd help you uh, find a cure and find better treatments to, to pediatric cancers. Um, this is Ty. Ty passed away a couple of years ago. Um, his dad's name was Lou. And he was a fraternity brother, or he is a fraternity brother of mine. His wife's name is Cindy. And other than having really, really poor choice in men, um, she's a really remarkable lady. Um, Ty died after two years of fighting a brain cancer. And why do I bring this up, okay? One, I want to keep you here. Not really, though. Um, I bring this up because everyone who sells online is usually also an online consumer. And if you shop on Amazon, they have a program called the Amazon Smiles program, okay? And you can pick any charity you want, and it costs you nothing out of every single purchase. Um, but if you pick this one or any one, they will donate a small portion of the sale uh, to the charity, and every little bit adds up. So um, I didn't want to end with a self-promotion, but this is some really good way that every single one of us can help, you know, a little bit. So uh, I appreciate you coming to listen to me. At the very, very end of the day, uh, I hope I've helped you a bit. And if you have any questions for me, I'm 100% I'm, I'm available for questions and answers. We talk to sellers all over the world every single day. Um, we don't charge for consultations. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you.